learn when the next seminar series is coming up and who the next speakers are. And I think with that, it's about time to begin. Today, I'm thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic communities. The seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on this Kiskit YouTube channel. Subscribe. You can always go back and catch up on anything you missed, but you can only ask questions here live now during the seminar. And today it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Steve Gervin from Yale University, who will talk about boson sampling uh, and quantum simulations in circuit quantum electrodynamics. Hello, Steve. How are you today? Hi, is that go? Doing fine. It's good to see you again, Steve. Um, where are you tuning in from today? I am in New Haven, Connecticut. All right. It's a wonderful place. Been there seven years myself. Um, before we lead into your talk, Steve, allow me to give an introduction uh, for the folks here. Uh, it is my personal real delight to host Steve Gervin today. Uh, this, uh, as many of you know, Steve is one of those rare few physicists, the kind of physicists that I deeply personally admire. And uh, I think about every conversation I've had with Steve, I walk away uh, feeling a bit more enlightened. Uh, I've had the uh, distinct privilege of having Steve as one of my dissertation advisors. So thank you, Steve, for your many hours uh, reading over and giving comments to the dissertation on reversing jumps. Steve is the Eugene Higgins Professor of uh, Physics and also Professor of Applied Physics at Yale University. He is uh, the director of one of the five DOE NQI National Research Centers. He has also uh, served as Deputy Provost for Research at Yale University. Steve is very widely recognized. He is a laureate of the Oliver E. Buckley Prize of the American Physical Society, and he's been named fellow of the American Physics Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. I could go on for quite a while, but I think you get the picture. Uh, recently, I would also like to add, Steve's published a very nice textbook on condensed matter physics uh, that I thoroughly enjoyed and may even replace Ashcroft, Merman, and Cattell books one day. So with that, Steve, uh, I turn it over to you. We will have questions during the talk. So folks, feel free to post those questions in the chat anytime. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Zlatko. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, at least virtually. And I'm glad to be able to talk to people who are as enthusiastic about the second quantum revolution uh, as I am. So I'm going to be talking, as Lako said, about boson sampling and quantum simulations of interacting many-body quantum problems where we'll be talking about interacting bosons. Uh, in this case, quanta of electromagnetic radiation, microwave photons. So. The take home message here is the following, that both quantum error correction and quantum simulation of physical models that contain bosons are both vastly more efficient if you have hardware that actually contains bosons. It's a very simple concept and I'll try to walk you through that in the next hour. So uh, you're familiar with discrete variable quantum systems, that is to say qubits or uh, that have two levels or perhaps qubits that have d levels. And if you had, say, uh, one qubit, you, it could be in a superposition of two different states. If you have n qubits, then you can be in a big superposition of two to the n different states. So for example, uh, if you have three qubits, you can label the states with a series of binary numbers where the zero and one tell you whether the qubit is in the ground state or the excited state on the block sphere. And two to the three is eight, so you'll have uh, uh, qubit states corresponding to uh, the binary representation of zero all the way up to the binary representation of seven. Those are the eight states. And you have eight complex quantum amplitudes that define that state. 
You may be less familiar with continuous variable systems. That simply means harmonic oscillators or boson systems. They can, uh, it could be a mechanical oscillator. It could be optical photons. Uh, I'm going to be talking about microwave photons, which are trapped inside centimeter scale superconducting cavities or uh, possibly in uh, two dimensional coplanar waveguide resonators. And harmonic oscillators have uh, an infinitely large Hilbert space labeled by the boson number, the number of photons or quanta of light that are inside the box running from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up. And so you could represent the same quantum information, that is these eight complex amplitudes, using levels 0 through 7 of this oscillator, as you could using three uh, qubits. Or if you had n qubits, you just need the first two to the n levels of this oscillator. And the nice thing about this object is it's literally just an empty box. If you want to use more states, you just add more photons to it. Uh, whereas if you want to get more a larger quantum register using qubits, you have to add more physical objects. So that's going to be the basis of certain important simplifications in both quantum error correction and in quantum simulations. So uh, I'll use dv, discrete variable, to represent, to, to, to mean two-level qubits, and cv, or continuous variable, to represent harmonic oscillators or uh, bosons. So photons are bosons because you can pile many of them into the same resonator. There's no Pauli exclusion principle the way there is for uh, fermions or electrons. And you can imagine two different hybrid architectures using both DV and CV quantum objects. Uh, here is the uh, uh, first all electronic quantum processor with two discrete variable qubits talking to each other by exchanging virtual microwave photons through this quantum bus, this uh, microwave resonator. You can also imagine a different architecture, which I call CV dominant, that the quantum information lives inside these harmonic oscillators, these microwave resonators, which are, and then the things that used to be the qubits are now ancilla objects used to control the photon states of these resonators and couple them and entangle them. So I'm going to be focusing not today on error correction, but rather on uh, quantum simulations. Air, this model of using bosonic codes for error correction has been very successful and was the first to um, actually get error correction to make things uh, better rather than worse. Um, but I'm going to focus on quantum simulations. So uh, if you have discrete variable qubits, those are like spin a half objects. And physicists think about uh, models of interacting quantum spins all the time. And those are relatively simple to simulate with qubits because they are mathematically equivalent to spins. Fermions are hard because when you have fermions traveling in in space-time, and they, there are two ways to arrive at the same final state. One way might be like this, and the other way, the fermions have permuted. Uh, their, they end up in the same destinations, but uh, different in a different permutation. If you have fermions, those amplitudes add with a, a tricky minus sign which is uh, difficult and expensive to represent with your qubits. 
Uh, you might think that bosons are relatively easy because they, they don't have that uh, minus sign. But it's less widely appreciated that bosons are also hard to simulate because uh, there can be many bosons in a single mode. The, the number is unbounded, as I showed you. On the other hand, I also showed you that uh, if, you, it, if you have... Um, two to the n possible boson states, it only takes n qubits to efficiently have the same dimension of Hilbert space. So it seems like that's sufficient. You should be able to represent the bosons with qubits. But actually, uh, physically natural operators for oscillator Hamiltonians, such as the one that a B, which lowers the photon number by one, or B dagger, which raises the photon number by one. They're very unnatural and difficult to realize in a qubit system. So there is this uh, mapping, you know, like this qubit state represents uh, seven uh, bosons. Uh, this one represents uh, one, this one represents zero. So the the representation of a very natural operator like B involves, if you use qubits, many different qubits flipping at the same time. And there's a funny superposition of all those possibilities with peculiar square root of n weights. And this turns out to be very expensive, complicated, multi-qubit gates that are difficult to realize in a qubit system and makes the simulation of bosons uh, in certain limits uh, using qubits difficult. Whereas it's completely natural if you actually have a physical harmonic oscillator in your hardware, then this is a completely natural uh, operator that's directly available to you natively. So, uh, my thesis is that if you have an architecture with built-in bosonic modes, that this can be very hardware efficient for simulating physical systems that contain bosons. You know, lattice gauge theory has lots of bosons. You could simulate phonons, lattice vibrations, polarons, which are electrons coupled to lattice vibrations. There, uh, condensed matter theorists are interested in things called spin boson models, which have both qubits and bosons in them. Uh, interacting models of bosons like the Bose-Hubbard model. And the thing I'm going to tell you about today is simulation of the vibrational spectra of triatomic molecules. And the mechanical vibrations of the molecule are also... Uh, bosons. So you can read, uh, here's a review uh, uh, doing this with hardware that works in the optical domain. Uh, we have certain advantages in the microwave domain using circuit QED hardware, which uh, I will show you. So I want to, that's the setup for the problem. I want to first tell you how an experiment you use the things that used to be the qubits to control the and measure the state of uh, of oscillators and then we'll use those that toolbox to do our simulation so um, so here's the physical setup there's a there's a three-dimensional cavity, centimeter scale. It has a transmon qubit inside it. It has this little antenna. It couples to the electric field of the electromagnetic mode, the photons that are trapped inside this um, uh, cavity. And here is the Hamiltonian. There's some characteristic frequency of our harmonic oscillator. And the energy is simply proportional to the number of photons that are in the cavity. So uh, I use the symbol A before here. I'm using uh, A, um, sorry, B before here. I'm using the symbol A to represent the uh, destruction and creation of photons. Uh, here is 
the ancilla qubit here used approximated as a two level system. Maybe this is a transmon, which actually has many levels, but I'm going to approximate it as a two level system. So a pseudo spin with, and this is the Z pally matrix. And if you detune the natural excitation frequency of the qubit and the cavity, then the effective Hamiltonian is called the dispersive Hamiltonian. It's given by some dispersive shift chi times sigma z times the photon number. So this Hamiltonian commutes with both photon number and the z um, state of the qubit, so they don't change. In order to change them, in order to control the system, we need to add a control drive. So an, a classical electric field coming down a wire and coupling to the resonator can excite the resonator. It can create and destroy photons. And another tone, a microwave tone at the frequency of the qubit can uh, Robby flop the qubit. It can raise and lower the state of the qubit. And this coupling between the two allows you to uh, control the system uh, and measure the system. So you can, um, you can excite the cavity with this term in a way that depends on the state of the qubit. And you can also rotate the qubit with this term in a way that depends on the state of the cavity because of this interaction. And you can prove that this gives you universal control over the combined system. So here's an example of that universal control. Here's a, a three-dimensional microwave resonator with a little a quarter wavelength stub inside. Here you send a classical uh, signal down to excite the cavity. Here is a transmon ancilla, another uh, auxiliary resonator. You send the signals down here to excite the transmon. And knowing the Hamiltonian, you can use a grape algorithm or other optimization algorithm to predict what uh, time-dependent signal you should send to the transmon and to the cavity in order to effect the desired tr um, transformation you want. So what we would want to do here is take the start with the transmon in the ground state, cavity in the zero photon state, and transition over 500 nanoseconds to the Fox state six, where there's exactly six photons in the cavity. And this uh, pulse sequence, uh, which can be calculated, predicted in advance, uh, does that exactly for you. If you only have the classical drive on the cavity, you can only make what's called a coherent state, uh, which is, uh, it's a, you don't have full universal control. You only can reach sort of quasi-classical states. If you want to make a Fox state, that is a state of definite photon number, you must have a two-level system or other anharmonic uh, ancilla to help you. And uh, you can do state tomography using uh, this same ancilla to measure these so-called Wigner functions. I won't go into the details, but here you can also use it to measure the photon number. And here you see the photon numbers entirely uh, at n equals 6. So that was an example of control. Now I want to talk, it's very important for the simulations I'm going to tell you about to be able to do very efficient measurements of photon numbers. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. So you could ask the question, is the photon number in the cavity equal to one? Yes or no? You, 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 that's a question that has at most one bit of information in it. And so uh, you should be, if you could map the answer to this onto the state of the ancilla qubit, you could gather that one bit of information. You could also ask a different question. Is the photon number equal to 13, yes or no? And uh, let's say there were 256 possible photon numbers. I'll show you that example later. Then 
the answer to your question most of the time is likely to be no. This is very inefficient sampling. Uh, it's a large query complexity using this method, although it turns out to be fairly accurate. So this is a, you know, I have grandchildren and teaching them how to play 20 questions is, is uh, tricky because instead of asking you, you know, uh, is it an animal? They ask you questions like, is it a, you know, a four foot tall uh, African elephant with a, you know, a missing left tusk or something? The, the answer to their questions is almost always no. And the information content uh, from answering that is nearly zero. But here's the circuit that will do that. Um, it's a, you have the qubit in the ground state, you have the cavity in some state psi, and you execute using our control techniques that I showed earlier, a conditional uh, uh, unitary on the qubit. And that conditional unitary is uh, to do a pi pulse to rotate the qubit from ground to excited state if and only if there are exactly m photons in the cavity. And then you measure the qubit. If its state flipped, then there were exactly m photons in the cavity and the state of the cavity collapses to being m. If the answer is no, then the state of the cavity collapses to what it was before, except there's now no longer any probability of, of there being M. So how do we actually do this? Well, we use our dispersive coupling, Hamiltonian here, and we see that the effect of this coupling on the qubit is it changes the coefficient of sigma z. But the coefficient of sigma z, that's just the transition frequency of the qubit, which now shifts by 2 chi each time I add a photon. Typically, chi is negative, so the qubit spectrum looks like this as a function of frequency. The qubit frequency is here if there are zero photons, here if there are 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, this separation can be, uh, you know, a thousand line width, so it's very distinct. And if I send a microwave pulse, that's a pi pulse, intended to flip the state of the qubit at this frequency, it will be on resonance with the qubit and will flip the qubit if and only if there's exactly one photon in the cavity. So that's how I execute this conditional unitary. I could ask a different question that has one bit. I'm only going to get one bit of information because I'm going to measure my ancilla, a single ancilla. I could ask the question, is the photon number equal to either one or three, yes or no? And I do that by sending a tone at this frequency and at this frequency. And if the qubit flips, <clears throat> I don't know whether it flipped because of this tone or because of that tone. I only learn that the photon number is either one or three, but I don't know which. Okay. So in general, I can actually measure any arbitrary binary function, binary valued function of the photon number. That is, I can... Uh, form a projector, a sum of the projectors onto the different photon number states, as long as the coefficients are either zero or one, so they're binary valued, I can carry out this conditional unitary and answer tricky questions like this. So here's a, a fancy way then to do a binary search for the photon number. So you know from uh, you know your computer science exercises that if you're uh, trying to find uh, something in a large uh, database that doing a binary search can be very efficient and take only uh, log n um, uh, tries to find something out of an, a, a, a database of size n. So the way this works is it's a series of these conditional unitaries followed by measurements. 
And I'm going to use this uh, binary valued function. I'm going to use these uh, binary values here in the projectors. And this is just the walsh hadamard transform of the photon number distribution. So this guy down here, if I apply this, I'm asking the question, I'm going to flip the qubit if and only if the photon number is in the upper half of the range of photon numbers I'm considering. And uh, so measuring this tells me the answer to that question. Then the next one uses this uh, uh, binary vector, and it uh, answers the question, uh, now we know I'm either in the upper half of the lower half of the whole range. Now I want to know, am I in the upper or lower half of whichever half I'm in, and so on, down to the final measurement, which is, is the photon number even or odd? So this is photon number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I use these tones at these different frequencies to effect this transformation. So... Uh, if I, what I can, uh, in a single shot with a quantum, four quantum non demolition measurements, I can get the first four binary digits in the represent, the binary representation of the photon number. And, uh, uh, so if the, if the first measurement is one, then the most significant bit is one. If the second measurement is different from the first, that meant the qubit flipped. So that's this. That means the next bit is one and so forth. And the circuit cost for, for sampling over a range of photon numbers n max is only log n max. So this is true efficient boson sampling, and it's exponentially more efficient than as asking the question, is the photon number zero, yes or no? Is the photon number one, yes or no, two, yes or no, all the way up to n. But because this requires uh, four consecutive uh, non-demolition measurements, it's somewhat more prone to errors, but it's, uh, it's uh, exponentially faster. So I'll show you uh, results using both. Okay, so this is our control and measurement um, toolbox. This might, I'm going to now apply it to a um, uh, simulation of an interesting physical model containing bosons, but maybe this is a good point to just stop and make sure everybody's on the same page and see if there are any questions. Thank you, Steve. Well, first of all, this is a really neat, uh, really awesome scheme, right? This is this uh, I was going to say beautiful. Uh, maybe a quick clarification. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this is the walsh hadamard again and what you mean by that? I think of the walsh hadamard as this uh, you know, uh, Fourier transform for binary values. Um, right. So if you look at, the, think of this as a time sequence, if you wanted to. Suppose I'm Fourier transforming a time series. Mm -hmm. The walsh hadamard transformation doesn't use sine waves the way and cosine waves the way the Fourier transform does. It uses square waves. So here's a square wave which is one and then zero, and here's mm -hmm. a square wave which is one zero one zero. So these are like different frequencies of waves, like in a Fourier transform, um, but it's square waves. Does mm -hmm. that help? That that helps a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah. And can you, uh, there's a question from the audience to clarify exponential gain, why, how is it exponentially quicker or over what? <laughs> yeah, so I showed you first a method where you could ask the question, is the photon number six, yes or no? Mm. So to find the photon number, I could prepare the state, or at least get the statistics of the photon number. I could prepare the same cavity state over and over again and I could ask the question, is the photon number zero? And I could, you know, some fraction of the time, the answer will be yes. Hmm. Then I have to do it all again and say, is the photon number one? And get the fraction of the time, the answer is yes. Hmm. Then two, then three, all the way up to n max, whatever my experiment allows me to, to reach. Whereas 
in the, and most of the time, the answer to those questions is no, because if you have a broad distribution of photon numbers and you ask, you know, is it 17? Most of the time, the answer is no. So this it's information theoretic inefficient. It takes uh, many samples uh, uh, and and scales with n max the the number of photons. Here, every time I make a measurement, I get a photon number. I get these four digits, binary digits. I get a result every time. So I'm literally sampling from the number distribution, and mm. that's um, much more efficient. Mm. And because this only takes log n max uh, digits to get an answer. Mm. You still have to, you know, repeat many times to get good statistics, but you don't have you do log n things instead of n things. Mm. Thank you. And uh, how does this compare with uh, linear optical boson sampling? Can we say something about that? Uh, I will mention some of the um, technical uh, requirements. Uh, people do try to do this with um, optical sampling, but I'll, I'll come into that in a, uh, shortly. Okay. And maybe last question here. Um, there was a question from the audience about the QND-ness of the sequence and how that matters or, um, you know, what happens right. to the function after each measurement here. Yeah. So let's just pick the parity measurement, which is something that we use all the time for doing quantum error correction. Parity, photon number parity is the stabilizer for these bosonic codes. So uh, it is possible to measure the parity um, roughly 500 times without destroying, without changing the parity. So it's Q and D. That, that's a measure of how quantum non-demolition it is. And uh, you can get the parity right when you measure it uh, with a fidelity of about, I've forgotten, 98.5% or something. So it's um, possible to do four of these in a row and um, you know this measurement doesn't do some damage, which then changes the results of subsequent measurements. With with high probability, uh, it it works all the way through. Not as well as just doing one of them, but um, still pretty well. As I'll mm -hmm. I'll give you uh, numerical. I'll show you data uh, error bars later. And do you have to reset the qubit each time, or simply you? Uh, well. In the actual experiment, it's useful to reset it to the ground state because this is the weak link in the whole thing. The qubit sometimes falls down from the excited state to the ground state. But in this, uh, I mean, theoretically, in the, in the way I'm doing it here, I do not reset it each time. I just collect the four measurement results and then compute the binary digits from this. So. Uh, this is a uh, the O plus symbol here is addition mod two, and so uh, if uh, it just tells you whether these two bits are different or the same, and so you can tell whether the bit flipped in between. That's all I need. The actual experiment reset the qubit and uses a slightly different formula here, but. Hmm. But the, the, cool, the cool thing is that unlike uh, phase, est this is a kind of phase estimation, but uh, mm -hmm. it's much better because I do, in phase estimation, you make a measurement and then you have to feed forward and make a slightly different measurement in each subsequent step. And that's uh, painful and expensive if you have latency in, you know, uh, in your control system. So this uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, have to worry about that. Well, that's very okay. helpful, actually. Yeah. Thank you. There are a few other yeah. questions. I'm going to table them until the end. Sorry. Uh, we... Okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, I'm going to be telling you. So there's this boson sampling problem where you have a, a whole bunch of beam splitters and you put in the FOX states of some specific photon numbers in the input modes. 
And then they take different paths that interfere with wave-like interference. And then you measure at the output how many photons appear at each port. And uh, if this is a very wide, uh, you know, if there are many photons and many channels, this is um, a very hard uh, sampling problem that's, um, uh, uh, you know, was recently uh, in this experiment from China was uh, touted as a kind of quantum supremacy experiment. So uh, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're only gonna use two modes and uh, we'll be able to compare our results to uh, simulations on a classical computer. Uh, but we're going to use this to not, not for supremacy purposes like this, but rather to, we're going to realize a simulation of the optical spectra of vibrating molecules and map it onto this problem, which is kind of cool. So, uh, so suppose we have the water molecule and it has all, you know, it can rotate and do all kinds of things, but we're going to focus on the vibration of the, the nuclei that, that it modulate the lengths of the chemical bonds. And we're going to look at the symmetric stretch where the hydrogens are moving in phase and the uh, anti-symmetric bending um, uh, like this. And uh, these mechanical modes are, they're not necessarily harmonic oscillators, but they're oscillators. So they're, they're, their excitations are bosons. And we're going to simulate the physics of these guys within certain approximations of these two bosonic modes by having two microwave cavities and the number of microwave photons in this cavity could represent, let's say, the number of quanta in the stretch mode and the, the number of microwave photons in this cavity could represent the number of quanta in the bending mode. And then we're going to have some ancilla, three ancilla transmons to help us uh, do the simulation, control the photon numbers and represent this uh, system. So the way that um, um... maybe just a quick clarification yep. on the previous slide, you can make a comment because um, usually here we, I, I, I guess just to clarify for people coming from quantum chemistry background, you usually think about the orbitals and fermions and exchange sign uh, minus sign and so forth. That we we don't have to worry any about any of the sign problems. Ah uh, yes, so so we have picked. Thank you. We have. I'm I'm going to say this later, but we picked a problem uh, in quantum chemistry, which is not the one where which people with quantum computers are also excited about, which is solving what the fermions, what the electrons are doing. We're going to take that from classical computer calculations. As you stretch the bond, the, the electronic bonding energy goes up and down, and that's like the, the spring constant that causes the, you know, uh, in, in the oscillator. This is the mass, and then the spring, the restoring force is in the, the chemical bonds. And that is a fermion problem with all those minus signs, but we're assuming that the, the we're going to let the chemists give us that uh, as a result of some uh, simulations on a classical computer. We're only going to solve the problem of the dynamics of these um, mechanical motion on a potential energy surface defined by the energy stored in the chemical bonds. And these frequencies are totally different than the microwave frequencies and so forth. That, and and the, these are mechanical and these are electromagnetic oscillators. None of that uh, matters in, in the way you do the simulation. Right. So, and then I guess if I understand right, in um, the classical chemistry simulation community, people would normally model this with mass balls and nonlinear springs, and that's what we want to study. Yeah, exactly. So, so here I, I'm drawing a, a sort of two dimension a slice out of a two dimensional surface. So here, these are kind of um, 
the coordinates for the bend and the stretch, so Q1 and Q2, as they vary, that represents these bonds symmetrically stretching or bending, okay? And as, as they stretch, the energy stored in the electronic bonds goes up and down. And it's a, I emphasize it's a two-dimensional surface. I didn't really draw that here, but it's, it's a, a the en energy is a function of the stretch and the bend. And the nuclei move around on that potential energy surface, and they themselves are quantum mechanical, so they have quantized energy levels for their vibrations in this two-dimensional um, uh, potential. And perhaps the chemist using some uh, pump probe control technique uh, is able to prepare the molecule in the first excited vibrational state. Then they send in a laser which breaks one of the bonds. So maybe the laser comes in and ejects an electron from here and shoots it out. So that's a photoelectron spectroscopy experiment. Or maybe it just promotes an electron from a bonding to an antibonding orbital, which suddenly changes the spring to a different value and also breaks the symmetry. There's a kind of, uh, you know, reflection symmetry about this line for these uh, modes. But if you break a, uh, change a bond on one side, it's no longer reflection symmetric and these modes will get mixed together. And that's an important part of the physics. So this red arrow indicates uh, a laser photon comes in and breaks one of the bonds and now the nuclei haven't moved. Q1 and Q2 are still in the same place. The bond kind of broke suddenly. But the, now the nuclei are moving on a different potential energy surface. It has a different curvature, a different spring constant. Maybe its minimum is displaced to a different position. And it can also be the two-dimensional surface, uh, the symmetry can change. It can be, rot Q1 and Q2 can be rotated or mixed together. And so what happens? Well, the molecule begins vibrating like this. And uh, if you Fourier transform what's happening to that wave packet and it's overlapped to where it started, that gives you the spectrum of the, the uh, molecule. Or put it another way, your, the initial wave function is some, some Gaussian or something, and now you're up here, and it overlaps many different uh, ex excited states on this new, of this new Hamiltonian. And the square of the overlap to be here or here, that tells you the probability that the transition costs you this much energy. And so um, you can look at the spectrum, you know, what laser frequency it took to, uh, for the laser light to be absorbed. And the more excitations that are left behind in the molecule, the higher the energy your laser light had to be. And so you can uh, work out from the frequency of the absorbed uh, radiation, uh, uh, how many quanta got left behind as vibrations and how much was used just to chain, to break the chemical bond. So we're, I'm going to go through the approximations we made. So here we're going to obtain these potential energy surfaces. Here you can see more clearly that the two core, it's a two-dimensional surface in Q1 and Q2. And... Um, and maybe this is blue one is the ground state potential energy surface and the orange one is the excited state, mean, meaning when the chemical bond is broken. We're going to obtain these from the chemists, our chemist colleagues, uh, by solving the fermionic problem that is the chemical bond problem on a classical computer. Then we're going to approximate these complicated surfaces as paraboloids, so that that is, we're going to approximate the oscillators as harmonic. 
But it's still a complicated problem because we're going to allow for different spring constants. Here's a high spring constant, low spring constant. We're going to allow the, the minimum of the surface to move, uh, let's say from there to there. And the symmetry axis of the surface is going to rotate from uh, the semi-major axis being this way to being that way. And that's the symmetry I mentioned. If you break the bond on one arm of the molecule, it no longer uh, has, uh, it's no longer aligned with these natural axes. The, the coordinate system has rotated. Okay. And we're going to, uh, th this uh, transformation, we're going to execute the unitary transformation that goes from the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian to the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. And uh, chemists call this the Doktorov transformation, and here's the original reference for that from 1977. So what what are the requirements to do this and what, how does it compare to what happens in the photonics world well you you need bosonic modes so you can use optical photons or microwave photons you need gaussian operations which are kind of the analog of clifford operations for uh, qubits so there's the beam splitter you need to be able to coherently mix one mode with the other. An excitation in one mode can end up in the, in the other because the, the, uh, you no longer have the symmetry axis lined up with the modes. It's twisted. In optics, that's called a beam splitter. You need squeezing, which uh, just changes the spring constant. You can have a large spring constant that gives this steep potential energy surface, and suddenly it changes to something uh, softer. You need displacements. So here's a circuit QED experiment that demonstrated those things. You need some non-Gaussian operations, um, like prepare a fine. If the experimentalist says, I'm measuring uh, the spectrum starting when I break a bond while it's in a certain initial vibrational state, those are Fox states. They're not Gaussian states. So you have to be able to prepare those. And then you have to be able to count the number of excitations that are left behind in this new eigenmode and that new eigenmode. So you need to be able to do a boson number resolved detection. So here's a, a reference for that. And uh, here's uh, something from uh, discussing all of this for in the optical domain. And squeezing and number resolved detection, they're possible in the optical domain, but it's much more challenging to do it in conventional quantum optics than it is in circuit QED. OK, so here's the circuit that uh, implements uh, this done the experiment done by Chris Wang uh, in uh, uh, Rob Sholkoff's group. So there's two microwave cavities, Alice and Bob. There's a coupler transmon that will do the beam splitter between them, and two ancillary transmons uh, that are used for um, uh, uh, other uh, purposes squeezing and, and so forth, and measurement. And so the first step is this non, you initialize everything to the ground state, and then you apply a unitary that creates the non-Gaussian initial state. You know, it puts two quanta in the bending mode and three quanta in the stretch mode, let's say. Then you carry out the sudden unitary transformation from the old Hamiltonian eigenstate basis to the new Hamiltonian eigenstate basis. And then you're going to measure how many excitations get suddenly created by when the, uh, when the chemical bond breaks. But, and that's the number resolving measurements in each cavity. But in between, we're going to do a verification step because uh, at the end of this, because there are sometimes errors. So the, 
goal of this transformation is to um, uh, start with the three ancillae in the ground state, execute the appropriate unitary transformation to change the Hamiltonian basis in the oscillators, and leave the ancilla back in the ground state. So if something goes wrong, there's a good chance that it'll be there'll be a flag go up, namely that one or more of these ancillae will not end up in the ground state. And so we check that before doing the measurement, and we reject five to ten percent of the runs because there was a flag error. So that helps improve the results. Okay, so now let's look inside this box a little more carefully, this unitary transformation. So we use the coupler transmon to squeeze cavity A, change its spring constant effectively, then squeeze uh, cavity B. Then we use this to turn on a beam splitter, which coherently mixes the two modes. That carries out the rotation in the Q1, Q2 plane that results from having broken the, the you know, symmetry by, by uh, ejecting an electron from one of the arms of the molecule. Then you have to do two more squeezing transformations, and then you have to displace each mode. And you can show that if you choose the squeezing parameters, the rotation angle, these squeezing parameters, and the displacement amplitudes correctly, you will execute this Doctorov transformation that takes you from one uh, basis, the basis state of one potential energy surface to the basis state of the other. So it's a fairly uh, sophisticated thing, but still it's only, uh, these are very natural operations, squeezing, rotations, uh, displacements, uh, when you have native bosons in your hardware. So, uh, so here uh, are the results. So this is the theoretical result for the spectrum. This is the wave number of the laser. So you can tell we're working with chemists because we have inverse centimeter wave number uh, energy units. And the, every time there's a peak, that means that the laser frequency is just right so that it, you're able to leave behind in the molecule a certain number of excitations in the bend mode and a certain number of excitations in the stretch mode. And uh, there, there's a whole forest of lines here. We allow up to uh, 16 different vibrational states in bend and 16 in uh, stretch. So there's 256 possible lines here. This is the ideal spectrum for photoionization of water starting in the vibrational ground state. Zero quanta for stretch and zero quanta for bend. Now let's look at what our simulation results look like. So we're going to carry out these unitary transformations and then measure how many quanta are in each um, cavity and then uh, assign, then determine the uh, location and strength of these spectral lines. And uh, Steve, and, yeah. Can you remind us in in the sense of the previous protocol what you vary in the experiment to vary the wave number? Uh, so um, so uh, well, we're not actually varying that. What we're doing is sampling from the spectrum. That is, some fraction of the time we'll find that there's thirteen quanta in one mode and two in the other, and that and we can knowing the frequency of the mode, we can calculate that that means there's a you've sampled from you know that it would have happened at this wave number, and you bin you make a histogram where you bin uh, you put points in here, and then you do it millions of times, and this is. So the location is, uh, we know actually, it's only the height uh, that we're trying to figure out. And that's how many times you see, you know, 13 in one mode and two in the other. And this one is some other combination. Thank you. Does that make, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Is there? And can uh, I'm a little confused. Can you help me understand why the the uh, purple points don't seem evenly spaced then? Um, so there's some funny irrational ratio of the two frequencies of the two modes. So 17 of one and six of the other can be close to three and one and nine and the other. Or, you know, there's um, uh, it, uh. by taking you know integer multiples of two different frequencies and adding them up, you get this funny non-uniform spacing. Does that help? Yes, yes, that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Uh, but there is a series of uniformly spaced ones which correspond to, you know, adding more quanta to one particular mode. That's all. Okay, so we start in zero and zero, and how how this is using the single bit, the slow, exponentially slow single bit measurement that I first showed you is the photon number in the left cavity three and the photon number in the right cavity seventeen or whatever. Uh, and but it's uh, and and you can see the results here. They look pretty good, but uh, one measure of the distance between the exact distribution and the measured distribution is this L one norm between the exact and the measured, where I j is P i j is the probability of having i quanta in one mode and j quanta in the other mode, and that uh, distance is about five percent. So that's some measure that the experiment was done with 95% fidelity, so to speak. If I use this exponentially more efficient sampling, the error bars are maybe three times larger, but uh, the exponential is a factor of 32 in this case. It's uh, quite a bit uh, faster. Out of the 256 possibilities, we, on we only have to make uh, um, four measurements in each cavity. Um, so um, I want to emphasize that typical optical photo detectors are not number resolving and they're destructive. They, you know, photo multiplier eats up the photons. But we have this big advantage that we can do efficient quantum non-demolition single shot boson number sampling. We can measure in four measurements on a single realization of the experiment, all four bits in the, uh, in the binary representation of the number of photons in the left cavity and the number in the right cavity. So we can measure which of 256 photon states the two cavities are in in a, in a single shot by this uh, sampling. And if you, uh, this having native bosons um, is also very efficient relative to trying to do such a simulation with a discrete variable qubit system. If you took um, a qubit based computer, you would have needed eight qubits just to represent the photon numbers and then lots of ancilla qubits to do the very complicated multi-qubit gates that I described. And there would be of order a thousand such uh, gates involving up to four uh, bits plus ancilla. And um, so this relatively simple piece of hardware with two resonators and three ancilla qubits uh, was able to do something with quite high fidelity that is currently uh, impossible on uh, what I'll call ordinary <laughs> quantum computers based on qubits. So we think this is um, uh, a nice illustration of the benefits, at least for certain classes of problems, uh, of having hybrid heart architecture with both uh, qubits and oscillators. So again, uh, the take home message is that I didn't talk about quantum error correction, but quantum error correction and quantum simulations of physical models containing bosons are vastly more efficient on hardware that contains naturally occurring bosons. And uh, so this experiment was done in the Sholkoff lab by Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis shown here. We collaborated with uh, actual chemists who uh, 
uh, it was quite a language barrier to learn about how they think about quantum mechanics and quantum dynamics and uh, molecular spectroscopy, but it was a very fruitful, uh, uh, once we got past the language barrier, very fruitful um, uh, collaboration. Ike Chuang helped us with the uh, complexity analysis of uh, what it would have taken to do this with, uh, with a qubit computer. And uh, I also work closely with the Devere lab uh, shown here, and I'll uh, stop there and take questions. Thank you very much, Steve, for sharing the, the great talk and uh, results. We have a few questions from the audience. And uh, actually, let's start with, a with maybe the easiest one here. There's a bit of discussion why the L1 over L2 norm uh, for your uh, error estimation of the difference in these two distributions. Um, well, I guess I'm not an expert on, on uh, this, but it, L1 is a little um, uh, more conservative. Mm -hmm. it, it it has a, there's a certain um, yeah maybe I'll leave it there I mean if the, the if the diff if the difference of uh, can you still see that or is it um, you can share it again I think and the, so oh, we can okay add. well okay um, it's uh, you know the errors. Are linear rather than quadratic in the deviation of the, um, you know, the peak height. So it's it's more conservative. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, there is also a question here. Uh, so um, can you remind us again of the difference uh, between the red dots and the purple dots? I guess the sampling versus the single bit. Right. So remember one method to find out. The statistics of the the photon distribution is to make a million measurements asking the question is the photon number zero and then mm -hmm. a million more is it one and is it two and is it three up to n max oh i see okay so that's what we call the uh, one bit method and then the other method was to just draw from the distribution directly uh getting the actual photon number uh, the four binary bits in each cavity. And so that's 32 times faster, exponent, you know, exponentially faster, but um, it requires in a single shot keeping the transmon happy for um, four measurements and the cavity happy for a little longer. And so, you know, error, it's more sensitive to errors. Right. And the former one, you do a single measurement per circuit instance and you run it again, then you change your measurement and so on. Right, right. Got it. Um, thank you. How much uh, squeezing uh, can you get or did you need here? Is it, you know, 5, 10 dB more? Uh, yeah, it's um, a little less, let's see, it's less than 10. Uh, it's actually, an, a, it's surprising, somewhat surprisingly, you can adjust that by, you can, um, change the squeezing and change the displacements and things and still get to the same answer uh, within within limits um, by rescaling things. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting the exact number, but it's it's uh, it's not difficult if you're if your goal in an experiment is just to do squeezing, that's what you care about, then it's not that hard to do. Um, about 10 or a little less. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, here's a few more questions. So uh, from, I know you didn't focus on air correction here, but I was wondering, this is from the audience, uh, from Jacob, if you could briefly discuss what air correction looks like on bosonic systems rather than qubit based ones. Absolutely. So, um, Let's do a head-to-head -head comparison between a certain qubit code, which I will describe, and a certain uh, bosonic code. So let's, there's, 
you know, the smallest number of qubits to, to correct a single error is uh, five. But if you're only interested in amplitude damping, that is um, decay of the qubit from excited state to ground state, then there exists a four qubit code discovered by uh, uh, Lung and Chuang and Yamamoto 20 years, more than 20 years ago. Um, and uh, so you take four qubits, right? And so there are now four physical locations where the error could occur. And, um, but there's only one kind of error. We're not talking about, you know, pally X and pally Y and pally Z. We're just talking about sigma minus. That's the only error that can occur in this model, amplitude damping model. So uh, you have five possible error states, no error or one of the given four qubits decayed. So you have to measure several multi-qubit error syndromes to figure out which of those five errors occurred. And that's not so easy to do, even with today's uh, fancy qubit hardware. You can write a code that with an oscillator that will do the same thing. Uh, uh, the main error in an oscillator is actually amplitude damping, slowly losing photons. And because the oscillator contains uh, many states, it can represent several qubits in one object. But because there's only one error, which is photon lost, you don't have to say which of four physical locations the energy was lost. It's just in this one oscillator. So actually, you only need a single stabilizer. If you make a code that's made of only even photon numbers, then the photon number parity is the stabilizer. If you ever see the parity change from even to odd, you know there was an error. And you, roughly speaking, you just have to add the photon back. It's a little more complicated than that. But, uh, that's so much easier than to, uh, because we can measure the parity with high fidelity and high quantum non-demolitionness, <laughs> uh, it's possible to reach the break-even point where the bosonic code, when you apply the error correction, uh, at least doesn't make things worse and in some cases actually makes it 30% to a factor of two better. Hmm. So it's the, the, the efficiency is having um, more states inside a single quantum object and a simpler error model. You don't have to figure out where in space which of the four discrete objects had the error. There's just one object, and it, it had the error, and it's easier to find it. Thank you, Steve. Um, and two more questions. Uh, if folks have any final questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, Jacob says, thank you for answering that. Very interesting and clear. Um, what is, uh, what's, what's your kind of perspective on uh, potentially what's next or interesting and in, for CV simulations like this uh, after the Frank uh, Coden uh, parameter simulations? Well, uh, so that's a good question. So uh, there are many directions we'd like to go. We made the approximation that the the potential energy surface that the vibrations of the molecule were harmonic. The potential mm -hmm. surface was quadratic. Um, in order to go beyond that to a more realistic and harmonic surface, then you have to be able to do conditional. Uh, uh, you, you can use phase estimation if you can do a conditional unitary that corresponds to time evolution on the anharmonic surface. There, so that's more challenging, but we'd like to learn how to do that. Um, you use the it's phase estimation. You use the phase kickback on the uh, ancilla to figure out the the spectrum. Uh, 
I'm very interested, you know, I, in my former life, I did condensed matter theory and the fractional quantum Hall effect, and I'm very interested in the possibility of simulating the fractional quantum Hall effect for bosons, hmm. where the bosons are microwave photons, and you have to trick them into thinking that they're particles that have charge and are moving around in a, <laughs> in a magnetic field. Hmm. And by phase locking the beam splitters that we use to to these beam splitters are funny uh frequency converting beam splitters because anyway there's a way to control the phase of the beam splitter so that when you go around a plaquette uh, in a lattice of resonators mm -hmm. you can pick up non-trivial phases that mm -hmm. make the particle think they're in a magnetic field mm -hmm. And then using the control techniques and snap gates and things, you can make the particles think they have repulsive interactions. And then you're set up to get the, uh, the uh, Mott-Hubbard Bose insulator or fractional quantum Hall effect for bosons. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris Wang is currently building the next generation of hardware that has nine a three by three array of such resonators to start doing those kinds of simulations. Oh, wow. That's oh, wow. a lot. <laughs> That's, it turns out it's a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and even so, even though it's three by three, it's still, you know, it's mostly edge and not volume, <laughs> not yeah. bulk. So it's, it's small from the condensed matter simulation point of view, but it's pretty big from, you know, controlling a quantum computer point of view. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But baby steps. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very familiar. Um, all right. Uh, a quick question, uh, I guess two more questions. I, well, I suppose for a review of this topic, somebody's asking about a review of this topic, I suppose I should direct folks to the paper or anything that comes off of mind for you. And uh, the last question, uh, we've had this persistent question, so thank you for raising this. It's a tough one, by the way. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, do you have any advice for a graduate student looking to begin a quantum computing project, but is coming in from a different field, such as engineering or material physics? So you have any words of wisdom? Yeah, well, this is a very important question because um, to take the net, we've made all kinds of progress, as you know, and uh, lo lots at IBM, for example. Uh, but to, to make further progress, you know, it can't just be a few physicists uh, hand building <laughs> these machines and trying to control them. We need uh, computer scientists and engineers and, and uh, uh, people that know how to build systems that are robust and uh, materials, I mean, in, in the quantum center that I run, we have people that are thinking about the very bottom of the stack, which is the materials that the objects are made out of, and then the qubits and the devices, mm -hmm. and then the software and, and, and the uh, physics applications at the top. And we need people that can communicate across those layers of the stack to co-design the, the whole thing. So, but at the same time, we don't want to say to a material scientist or an electrical engineer, okay, go get a PhD in physics for seven years and then we'll talk. That's not going to work either. So, um, I think uh, part of the, what all of the national uh, quantum initiative, uh, quantum information science research centers are going to be doing is thinking about workforce development and uh, outreach and and interdisciplinary um, uh, training. And I think you, you know, uh, physicists can teach you quantum mechanics in a way that takes years to get to <laughs> anything very uh, interesting. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of places, and uh, my own included, are developing courses. I'm going to be teaching a new course at Yale uh, starting in a couple of weeks. Um, trying to remove a lot of the physics from mm -hmm. the quantum mechanics and teach, uh, teach it as kind of a funny, you know, version of linear algebra. And that's, um, understandable to engineers and, and computer scientists. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, you have to just jump in, learn a little bit, and bring your um, expertise in a way that makes you useful. And you don't have to understand absolutely everything in order to make a contribution. Uh, but you know, and you'll gradually pick things up. So, uh, but it you know, it's still challenging. I mean, just talking to the chemists for this for this paper that I told you about. I mean, they know quantum mechanics, we know quantum mechanics, but there was a big language barrier. And uh, so it's it's not easy to get into these interdisciplinary things. But if you work at it, uh, you can. Thank you, Steve. And Nathan also thanks you for the interesting talk. I think uh, if there are no further urgent questions, I think at this time, since we're 15 minutes over, anyhow, I'd like to thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I'd like to thank you, Steve, for uh, taking our invitation and for the great, wonderful talk and results you shared with us today. And uh, go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it, I, I uh, enjoyed talking uh, this kind of science with folks. And thank you for your excellent questions. Yeah, so thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Steve, again, for coming. And uh, this talk will stay recorded and live, so you can subscribe to the YouTube, YouTube channel, go back and watch it. If you missed anything, and otherwise, we'll see you next Friday at noon Eastern time with Alana Skorogozak, who will have a very nice follow-up to this talk. So thank you, everyone, very much, and we'll see you next Friday.